All right, so I'd like everybody to take a nice big deep breath. Close your eyes if you want and let it all go. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. So before we get started, I just have two comments. Number one, uh, normally after the class is over at five o'clock, I will stay on and chit chat or answer questions and whatnot, but I have a, a memorial service to go to tonight. So we'll probably end a lot closer to five and I'll close out the screen. So no talking today, but if anybody has any questions or anything they want to discuss, you can always send me an email. And the other thing is, I just wanted to say thank you to people who have sent checks or put things on sale and in, in assisting me to help pay for the Zoom classes and for my services as teaching the class. I truly appreciate and I'm very grateful for anyone that has contributed. So we are going to, where did I put that paper? The section we've been in before. Okay, so Mary Ann, before yes. we, before yes, we get started, I do, have, yeah. I do have a question. Sure, go for it. <clears throat> yeah, my understanding of forgiveness is you're forgiving yourself for believing that the illusion is real or that some aspect of the illusion is real. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Let me actually read the definition of forgiveness from the glossary index and it says forgiveness is our special function that shifts perception of another as an enemy and that's a special hate relationship or a savior idol which is a special love relationship to a brother or friend removing all projections of guilt from him the expression of the miracle or vision of Christ that sees all people united in the sonship of God. So basically what that means is right now we see our brother as our problem. You know, I'm the innocent victim, they're the problem. If it wasn't for them or, and again, this can be a person, a place, a situation, an experience. Something outside of me has taken my peace away. And the way this is set up within the box of my world, that's right on. That's the only thing I have to access or understand. But as the Course is trying to help us understand, you see this picture because of what's placed in the mind, which is the belief of separation, which brought the guilt, sin, and fear, kill or be killed, and that we believe we're separated. And because the answer was given that nothing happened and we weren't ready to accept that answer, we chose to stay here, forgot this existed, and then had to find a way to get rid of all that guilt, sin, and fear because it was probably very much like, let's say you're in a bright sunlight day and somebody just abruptly turns off all the lights and you're totally in darkness and terror. That was pretty much the experience that we had at that moment. So the way we solved the problem, because we were afraid to go back to one, is, was we projected into the world and made our brother or something outside of us the problem. So when it says forgiveness is our special function that shifts perception of another, because some of the characters in our dreams are our enemies, some of them are our special love relationships, but that's not who either of them are. We're really all one but we're playing this game here that's keeping us very focused in the world experience. And so we always think I have to forgive this character. And you mentioned the idea, well, I have to forgive myself. Well, it's not Jason that's being, that's forgiving himself. It's Jason that's letting go of this, coming up here and realizing the reason why Jason sees himself as an innocent victim and he sees his brother as a perpetrator is because Jason wanted to see that because he wanted to hold on to this instead of drop this and go back home to the oneness of God because he was too afraid at that time. 
So literally forgiveness is recognizing that none of this is real. It doesn't have anything to do with I'm going to be a, a good person and forgive my brother because I'm this spiritual person and I study the Course in Miracles. And in the book, this song, a prayer, actually it's a pamphlet, it goes through like four or five different ways that we play the part of forgiveness that has absolutely nothing to do with the concept of forgiveness in the Course. Does that help? <laughs> yes, yes, but at the same time, we're, yeah. for, forgiveness is forgiving ourselves for believing that the illusion is real. That is, I mean, isn't that a simple way to put what but, you just but, said? Yes, but be aware that in forgiveness, there isn't a jo Jason that needs to be forgiven. Okay? It, it's almost more like it's, the, it's literally the understanding that none of this is real. So it's, it's the dismantle of the characters that we've put into place that played out this thought system. So, and, and so what yeah. you're saying is, is Jason, Jason is not, Jason is not forgiving himself for believing it's real. Correct. Jason is yeah. just Jason is waking that up to the real. realization that he was never this in the first place and neither was my brother. Okay. Okay. And, and that's a little different. Right. And again, you know, we're going to go through these many phases of, you know, and the course even describes the idea that words are just symbols of, war, of symbols. And it's, it's very hard from where we are because I think I'm me and I think there are people outside. And whenever the course speaks to us, the course is literally always speaking to this or this. Only because this is who I identify with, I filter it through Jason or Mary Ann. And it's hard to step that next step up to realize he's never really even talking about this. This is simply an effect of the thought that's in the mind. So the solving right, of but at the same, the problem. Go ahead. But at the same time, it's more accurate to say there is no world, right? Absolutely, correct. There is no Jason. There is no world. Correct. You know, yes. yes. Not that Jason is forgiving himself for believing that there is no world, just that there is no world. It's a, it's a very different statement, actually. It's a very different statement, and that's why I try to kind of like hone it in there and keep kind of bringing it to the surface because... Again, we're looking through limitedness, and this is very unlimited, and it's you know it's a fire further reaching understanding of what it really means. Marianne, yeah, go ahead. Um, isn't it also not buying into the ego's interpretation of the tiny mad idea, yeah. which which is is real and it's serious. Very, yes, yes. And, and, you know, if you think about that one line, the tiny man idea was um, when the Son of God remembered not to laugh. We had the choice between these two. We chose this, and then we took this very seriously. So literally everything since then has been serious. It's real. It's, you know, there's no, no way I can get out of this. I'm a sinner. I'm bad, blah, blah, blah. And the whole time Jesus is, or the Holy Spirit is holding the awareness nothing happened. The first word up here is nothing happened. And this charts here every single week. But so much of the practice and the understanding of the course takes place here because nothing happened doesn't make any sense to any of us where we're sitting. And so we explore what, what the setup of the ego is and why we set it up so that we can eventually have it dawn on us that why would I want this thing that's not even real to run my life and my experience when I can realign with the understanding that nothing happened? Right. So the practice of that is the reflection of that that's going on on this level. Correct. When I'm taking something that I think is happening out there and believing it to be serious and real. Yes. And, and be very aware as well you know, the course talks very specifically, there's no hierarchy in illusions. In illusion. There's no hierarchy in miracles. Well, in our lives, you know, if I crack my nail, most people would say, well, that's no big deal. But if, you know, somebody abducted my child, that, that would be real. And that would be something to be serious about. And obviously, the way the world is set up, that is our experience. 
what Jesus is trying to help us understand an illusion is an illusion is an illusion is an illusion but we we haven't caught up to that understanding to the depth that he is introducing this to us and yes we take it all seriously and justifiably from where we were i guess you could say trained to experience it as being so again so much of the you know the way jesus presents the course you know some of the workbook lessons at the very 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 beginning you know this this pointer means nothing my hand means nothing this cup means nothing well most of us when we first started reading some of the workbook lessons like what is he talking about but he's really very slowly and very specifically walking us through recognizing that the solidity of this world that we have made our only experience is not really that solid and it's not real and it's not not it doesn't hold the value that we think it does and what we've given it it's just an illusion and again an illusion is an illusion is an illusion but you know marianne those two statements are very different to say that i believe you know i'm forgiving myself for believing in the illusion versus there is no world those are two very different They're extremely statements. different yes and that's why again I, we we need to get out of the me again because, you know, and again, that's going to be, it's going to feel like that at times in our experience. But ultimately, you want to wake up to the dream. You know, again, if Jason's dreaming a dream where he thinks he's better and he needs to forgive himself, he's still in the dream dreaming he's a Jason forgiving himself. But the real answer is wake up from the dream and then all of that just falls away. You know, can we? What, one sec, Ken used to sometimes say, you know, it's like a house of cards. If you just pull that bottom card out, poof, it's just going to all tumble. Well, that bottom card is none of this is real. Yeah, I think that I recall from one of, of, uh, 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 one of Ken, uh, Ken's you know, CDs that, um, that you are to forgive yourself for projecting that onto that person. Right. And, 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 and to me, this is a much simpler way uh, from, for me to, uh, uh, to look at it. Right. Yep. And, and again, in the beginning steps, we're, we're going I to... I think that this is what Ken said. Right, right, right. And, and again, you know, he would even say, it's, it's almost impossible for most of us to look through a lens that I don't exist, that, that I don't have a body, God doesn't have a body, and none of this is solid. Well, we live in a world that appears to be extremely solid. How, how right. can we step away from that with one big gigantic step? So in my experience, I'm going to start with that kind of a concept, but eventually I'm going to step back and step back and realize it's, it's just all an illusion or it's none of it's an illusion. There is no in-betweens here. That, well, if I knew that this was all a, uh, a, all, all a oh, illusion, I wouldn't have to be taking the course of miracles. That's that's because awesome. I because I would be that would I would be there. Yeah. Absolutely correct. right, but it's not Jason believing he's separate. There is no Jason. Jason's a puppet. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. I heard a female voice a few minutes ago starting. It, to it was gone. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Don. How are you? Good. What does the course say? Um, is the purpose of creation, or is was creation a mistake, or is okay. there creation? Yeah, the course or? actually has a very specific understanding about that, and what that is is what God made is creation, and everything within God's creation is an extension of what He is, and it's all oneness. When the Son of God had the thought or the tiny mad idea of, I wonder what it would be like if I could be God. At that moment, when it was taken seriously, God had to be kicked off the throne because there is only one throne. And in order for that experience to be played out, the Son of God, who now has separated from the love of God, is now sitting on the throne. And now the world is all separate. Now the Course is very specific of the word usage. From that moment on, or that experience on, whatever you want to call it, this was called making instead of creating. 
that only God can create, and we are an effect of God's creation. When we took on the identity of the separated son, we now, from then on, are making what we experience within the world. Different than creation, it's our making. And with it became the opposite of all the attributes and gifts that God gave us. Does that help? That, uh, would you say oh, that the only thing that God created was love? That would be a good thing to say. And, and it, it is our job to extend the love. Well, I would say it's, a, I would say it's slightly different. I would say our job is to connect with the love and then we will automatically extend love because there wouldn't be any barriers to keep you from expressing that love. So I hear the big bang as a moment of, Correct. is that the moment that the course says that we went, that we changed the throne? Correct. And ever since then, we basically, when we took this seriously, as, as Rose was talking before, this became the, the experience that we lived in. And literally this would actually cover over this. It wouldn't make this go away, but it would cover over it. And we have no access to this any longer and we have no access to this any longer. And all we now know about is this. Now the course is trying to you know, uncover some of the um, veils that, have kept, that were kept hidden so that we can begin to understand how this all got set up and what the results and the effects of that are. So Dawn didn't choose because Dawn doesn't exist. It well, happened and I'm a byproduct. We have to go a little bit further. The ego doesn't exist either, but we believe it does because we believe and we've taken seriously that thought system. Okay, so literally there's just two thought systems, the thought system of the Holy Spirit or the remembrance or the reminder or the mem memory of the love in our mind or the opposite. So literally this, you know, Dawn, is just a puppet being played out of this play that became um, operated by the choice to choose for the opposite instead of to remember who we are in oneness. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Marianne, it's Helene. Hi, hi Helene. Um, hi. Would it be fair to say that as, as the decision maker, um, we're asleep? And, and the course is here to say, wake up. Um, <laughs> that you, you're dreaming, what you think is real is an illusion. And really, we've never left the love of God. We're simply an idea in the mind of God. Correct, yes. And I, I like to think of the, and when Helene said the decision maker, that's what's called DM decision maker here. And literally, if this was a board game, there would be a pointer and it would either point to this or it would point to this. And so literally the course is showing us, since we pointed to this, what this means, what it represents, how we found ourselves here and what the effects of that are. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, literally this would cover over this and we totally forgot that this existed. And Ken would say that the number one most important thing about the course is it's, it's showing us that we have another choice. See, when I was just aligned with this, I had no clue that I had another choice. And even if, you know, in my confrontations and my experiences in life, I may not observe it, I may not um, even consider the possibility of the idea of forgiveness, whatever form it may look like, I never knew that there was a completely healed place that I could return to whenever I'm ready for it. Does the Holy Spirit straddle both thought no, forms? No, no, this, no. this line connect, cuts between the two of them. You're either here or you're here. Nowhere does any of those come together. And you know, Bob, will, Bob Wolf will sometimes talk about the idea of we don't want to ask God to come here and fix our world. We want to ask we want to ask that we reconnect with the truth of who we really are. But very important that we realize nowhere do these interplay in any way, shape or form, except for in my choice 
either to choose this or to choose this. And the way I find out what I'm choosing between these two is the effects that I'm experiencing in the world. If I have a world that has anything that's not completely peaceful, I know I'm over here. Even though as I start to choose here, I will begin to have more and more reflections of that peace and love within. Now we as individuals teeter back and forth, not by dragging this here or this here, but because we choose this and then we choose this and then we go right back here and then we choose this and then we choose this. So it's, it's a teeter-totter ride in regard to in any given instant, I'm choosing one or the other and I go back and forth. Marianne, we are not really aware of making a conscious choice. That's what the world shows us, mm -hmm. what choice I have made. And then I can yeah. just become aware, well, ouch, that doesn't feel very good. Uh, perhaps I've made the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. And that's where the atonement or the principle of forgiveness comes in. Mm -hmm. but, and that's very hard as, or very different from, you know, what Jason brought up. There, there are two very you know, diametrically opposed ideas going on here. And one, I exist, and in the other one, I don't exist. So it's terrifying. Well, it is. And, you know, literally, the choosing of this ultimately, now again, we're going to have these back and forth, and we're going to have a reflection where my, my expression as this character, the puppet called Marianne, will now be operated by the puppeteer of love, and I will express through love through that puppet, just like I'm always expressing through something less than love when I'm identified with the ego. Um, I, we can only take ourselves where we believe ourselves right now. And Jesus, you know, it's very specific throughout the course. He knows we, we don't get that I'm just a thought. I've been made to believe, you know, from the moment I took my first breath that this character is me. Well, I don't just erase that in one easy wipe, you know, especially since not only is it from this whole lifetime experience, it's from the Big Bang experience on, that in consciousness, the Son of God has lived and breathed and experienced this as its reality, yeah. even though it's not real or true. Yeah, and I, um, I had an experience this morning about how we go back and forth. I was talking and the words were just flowing out of me and I stopped and I got scared and I pulled everything back together again. Yes. Um, and, and that's what's constantly going on, this back and forth. Yep. Um, and most of the time we're unaware of it. Yes, and, and, it's, and it's, it's really so subtle as well. It's like you know, you're being operated all the time. Yep. And suddenly you're being operated by this, and that's uncomfortable because mm -hmm. I'm used to being operated by this. So you would think as soon as you flipped over here for a second, you know, the angels would be you know, singing hallelujah because you made it finally. But because we've been identified with this for eons and eons of times, it's got the stronger hold not because it's real, but because we've given it that hold. So the, this is not as comfortable as you might think it would be where we're sitting right now. But we'll get used to it. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Also, yes. accepting, accepting that I often yet have a problem when I, with the idea of choice because on one level, we really don't have any choice because everything is what it is. And some of that, it, it has to do with, <coughs> oh, I can't talk, with the recognition of that. Right. Or is that just too confusing at this point? Um, do we have it, you know, because there's so many levels to- Right, exactly, yeah. And I know there's a place near the end of the text that talks about the idea that the only real choice we have is to choose again. But, you know, no. part of the deal is I have to realize that where I am is an effect of a choice I've already made. And that's something we have to, I think, intellectually begin to digest so that we can come to a point 
where when I'm, you know, let's say there's a major um, conflict going on in my experience and suddenly this awareness comes to me as an effect of many choices for healing that I think, you know, a thought pops in my head where, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to continue to perpetuate this? I know this isn't the answer any longer. Oh, well, but, in it, oh, but in the end, we only have one choice, and that is when we're going to go on the other mm -hmm. side. Because right. we will all yep. eventually be on the we, other side. But when? Yep. And again, you know, initially we didn't get that I'm here because I wanted to be here. You know, many people say, well, I don't remember asking to separate from the love of God. Well, none of us remember that intellectually. So now the only thing we basically have to work with is to look at the effect of the choice that's already been made, as Helene was saying, um, and see, you know, can I be triggered by something in the world? Yes, I must be coming from here. I, this is Andrea. Go ahead, Andrea. And I, okay. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of just, you know, the, the reason I ever came to the course was because I was having a lot of difficulty with how God wasn't helping me. <laughs> and um, I, I find it interesting that to, um, uh, we, we want God to fix our world. That's a, a lot of what God has been perceived to be for. Come into this world, like, so what, you know, what's ours and what's God's? Well, ours is the our backyard and our living room and our house and our president and all that. That's ours. And God has different things that somehow in our mind. Um, and that uh, um, just that, you know, that to fix our world is, is really what we've been, we perceive that that's what God's for. He's supposed to fix our world. If somebody's sick, you pray that they get better. If somebody's hurt, you pray that they, um, things go away. If, if they're having problem with it, you know, uh, a spouse or something, you pray that they don't get divorced or, so that's just how, that's my, uh, that whole concept of what God is for. And it's, it's disappointing um, eventually. And then God gets the blame for how awful things are because that's the way God wants it. That's our idea. And that's not a path to peace. So if you're tired of being upset about the world and where, how God isn't here, then this, this is, um, you know, the, the path is, is now the course instead of what we think God is for is not true and so the the um the course moves us gently to see um that you know that, that that's that that's the way it is that, that god is not that how how you know gently shows us how we are the ones uh giving giving into the ego um so that's all i wanted to say yeah that's absolutely correct and we could also apply that to our brother our brother's job is to provide us with whatever the hell we think we need at this moment. And when they don't, I'm justified to attack them and not love them. So it really doesn't matter if this character is a God or if this character is my brother. I've got this, this thought system is set up in a way where again, even with God, the course specifically states the God of the illusion as the God of sickness. He's not a God of pure love, like true God is. He's a God that has the same attributes as the illusion of me and you and my brother. So it's all set up that we play the game here, and the, the game isn't taking place here. It's a camouflage that keeps us totally focused on fixing something here so that I can be okay or, or all right. And the answer will never be found here because the answer doesn't live here. You know what I think is helpful with that? Uh Rose brings up Byron Katie's work a lot. Uh, you know, uh, Rose, help with this. Is you know, what is God's business? What is my business? What can I do something about? And what do I need to just allow to happen? Yeah, there's my business, there's your business, and then there's God's business. Uh, and and she's talking about it on this level. But it's basically, if I'm in your business, if I'm concerned about what you're doing or what you're not doing, 
or whatever. If I'm if I'm concerned about whatever you're doing or saying, blah blah blah, I'm in your business. Which the purpose of that is to keep me from being in my business, paying attention to what I'm thinking, what I'm believing, what I'm experiencing. And it's the same thing with God's business. God's business is whatever's going on out there in the world. And I have no control over it, none. But I can sit here and worry about it and be concerned about it and whatever. Um, use it as a distraction from dealing with your own business. And that's that's yeah. all his purpose is. It's uh -huh. to keep me out of my own business. Right. And she says, being in my own business is a full-time job. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I think that's very helpful. Sure. I do too. It also says in the course that the purpose of the world was to make us mindless. Absolutely. Yes, and as long as I'm in this square, I'm mindless. All I have to work with is this square and trying to manipulate this square so that I, the character I'm playing, is got it better than it I did yesterday or whatever it is. I got to fix something here so I'll be okay. But even if you're thinking you're believing in the illusion, you're still the one thinking, right? You got it. That's the problem. That's the central problem. Yep. Yeah. And the course is really <laughs> brutal when it explains to us, you, you think you think that you, nothing you think you think is real. Nothing you hear, you see, none of that's real. So that kind of wipes out all that thinking stuff we think we think and takes it to a totally different level. And as Ken Wapnick's wife used to say, that was stunked. And the only real thought is the thought of love. But that's not real helpful because we're over here playing over here. But at least we're starting to understand that there is another way, even if we're not ready to access it yet. And that's a huge step in the right direction because before I, I had no recourse here. This is all, I could just, you know, like a dog being tied to a fire hydrant. I could just go around and around and around, nowhere to go. And no real solving of the problem as it was set up. And it's tricky because within the context of this, you know, we can do seemingly things different that can bring forth a different effect and we think we've accomplished something. But there's usually a downside to almost everything that's within the world. And it won't take you home as long as you're stuck in just this awareness. And, and as Helene said, it repurposes the world because now I look at whatever my reaction is and see oh you know i'm just choosing i'm just choosing the left side of the chart that's all that's happening and i'm not saying i'm there but i've had moments of that where it's very helpful so it's repurposing absolutely the the distraction repurposing you know the, the mindlessness correct and and kind of going back to the byron katie concept if I stop focusing on fixing this person or telling God he's supposed to do it somehow different. And I start looking at my part in the play of the way this is. And I realize my, I, my piece has been lost and I think it's from this character, but if in truth it's really coming from here, that whole plan is just wiped off the, the chart. And then it always has to come back to, wait a minute, I must be aligned with this because I've lost my peace. Not good or bad, simply a wonderful awareness if eventually I want to come to a place for, for being connected to peace. Helene, did you have something? Yeah, I just, the difficult part of that is- All of it, go me, on. <laughs> yeah, it's me saying, I don't know. You know, and it's the unknown that I seem to be afraid of and that, that's everything that's going on. I have no idea what it all means. Nope. None. Nope. And, and yet, I think I'm right. Yep. You know, that's the problem. The I think and the I'm right are, you know, there's like an equal sign in front of them, but it's not true. Yep. It's just and not true. When I'm living there, they have to be wrong on top of it. Yeah. Which is the perfect, you know, the, it, which is the effect of the setup of this whole program. So, so it's a gift, but it's one that we don't always want to open. Oh, gosh, absolutely not. Not initially. I think as we go along, um, we become more and more aware that when I do, the effect begins to reflect in a more 
you know, loving way. So I'm more drawn to it. But initially, oof, no. <laughs> you know, there'll be many times you go, well, I don't, you know, there's a line, the course where it says, whichever one of you is more sane at the moment, have the opportunity to ask for healing. Well, after a while, you're going to go, you know, I don't want to be responsible for no one anymore. You know, let them have be the problem, not me. I've had enough of this. But as you slowly work on it and realize that's really the only way out, then you're more mobile. But initially, because uh -uh. initially my my the whole setup is I'm an innocent victim. You're the idiot. Let's get you doing something different. I can be okay. Well, to turn that all around and realize I'm here because I wanted to be here, and then I made my brother guilty so I would have a reason to hate him. That's a very different storyline. Very very different storyline. Not a very nice storyline, but a very different storyline. But then when you come to the realization, this is my salvation. Having my brother, and again, my brother can be a circumstance, a car, a toaster, or whatever. Having that be able to take my peace away and then using this for the different purpose is literally our salvation. Because we dumped this here, pretended it didn't exist here, and then we only lived in here, popped in as an innocent victim, and now everything is somebody else's fault and not my fault. So as we turn that around for it with a different purpose, now I'm, I'm constantly using the projection for a totally different reason, and then I can walk towards healing. Any other comments before we go on? I hear silence. <laughs> All right, this is actually quite interesting because um, this will really just fall right into everything I was planning on talking about today. So we're going to go to text 297, and I'm actually going to start on paragraph 6, even though we've, we've actually touched on this paragraph uh, uh, before. I just Some ideas kind of bubbled up, and hopefully will help you understand just a little bit differently from a different perspective. All right, so this paragraph basically starts by do not be concerned about how you can learn a lesson so completely different from everything that you have taught yourself. How would you know? Well, as we just described this whole setup, this whole scenario, and as Helene said, you know, this is not easy. You know, okay, I finally intellectually have a different understanding of how I found myself to be here. But dang, this is not this is not a this is not eco friendly, and it certainly isn't what I was asking for when I came into the Course of Miracles. All I wanted was to make my life a little bit nicer. So basically, he's saying we taught yourself. How did I teach myself? Via the choice of the ego, and then dumping it out here, so it appeared that my, something else besides me is responsible for the guilt or the fear or anything else that I'm experiencing in the world. He said, your part is very simple. Okay, you're going to love this line. You need only recognize that everything you learned you do not want. It kind of falls into a little bit of what Helena was saying. Well, am I at a place that I want to understand and recognize that everything I taught myself since the Big Bang is not what I want? And we're just not there yet. That, that doesn't, you know, I can read those words, but that's just not where I am in consciousness. And so that line will be something that will develop to the point where, yes, I do come ultimately to that place where I recognize that everything that I ever learned that now I don't want, including being right, including being this character called me. None of that will have hold value when I eventually come to the realization that this is a valueless world and I want to connect with the true value. All right, so how many of you are ready to recognize that everything you learned you do not want? Anybody out there? I wanna see lots of hands. <laughs> All right, so then he goes on and again, kind of a comment to what Helene just said, ask to be taught. And do not use your experience to confirm that you have, that what, excuse me, confirm what you have learned. So Jesus is saying, okay, this is what happened. This is how it got set up. You're now stuck in this place that isn't very comfortable. Now I'm going to teach you how to remove yourself and align with who you really are. 
are you willing to have me teach you in every moment of every day? And again, for most of us, the answer is probably not every day. Maybe on Thursday, when I can't tolerate my very, very next breath for a moment, I might have that willingness to connect from that level. But even that's a crack in the ability to be begin to understand and to reconnect back to who we really are. When your peace is threatened or disturbed in any way, <clears throat> And again, any way that our peace is being, um, where's the line here? Your peace is being threatened or disrupted. And understand that that means we got lots of places to practice because I don't know about the rest of you, but the peace can be disrupted quite frequently in my life. Jesus is asking us to say this to ourselves. And as you can see, it's italicized. So Jesus is emphasizing this because this is something that's very important for us to pay attention to. And again, back to what Helene said, I don't want to know that I don't know anything. But Jesus is asking us to be willing to, to at least hold that space of maybe I don't know what I thought I knew. And definitely the effects of me thinking I know that what I thought I knew aren't really bringing me what I thought I wanted. So maybe he's got a better way. So it says, I do not know what anything including this means. And how many moments in the midst of an argument or something you're, you know, an upset, did the thoughts pop in your head? I do not know what anything including this means. Well, again, probably not too often because we're so addicted to this thought system and this thought system is very um, automatic. I don't have to wake up in the morning and think, okay, at three o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to be, I'm going to have an ego attack. No, it happens and I'm on the floor and I'm totally confused and I'm spinning. But he's asking us to work on bringing this to light in our experiences whenever we can. And again, I do not know what anything including this means. And so I do not know how to respond to it. If I don't know what something is, I certainly don't know how to fix it or change it or, or respond to it. Okay, duh. All right, but watch us go. <laughs> no. And to begin to become aware of, wait a minute, maybe he has a better answer than the one I have. You know, but if you think about that, that is awfully scary to say you don't know anything. Absolutely. And that oh, that means you you are helpless. You are helpless in this cruel cruel world. That I don't know nothing. That means anybody can do anything to me that they want to. You yeah. know that's scary. It's extremely scary, Bob. And again, the reason it's so scary is because I'm so mind melded, um, addicted to the thought system I've lived under since the Big Bang. Of course, choosing the opposite of that's going to be very scary for us. And, and, and all these things that I don't know, they seem to work in this ego world. Well, they work to some extent, except for the fact that this is a faltering world and I might get something that I thought I wanted, but the next day it's already starting to decay and fall apart. Right. And even though it might be enjoyable or you might like it, it really doesn't bring that peace that is what is being talked about in the course. But yeah, great substitute, no question. Right. No question. And you know, like we're not stupid here, people. <laughs> you know, that makes me feel better. I'm going to try that. But eventually, you know, sort of like the prodigal son in the Bible, where the son went out, and spent all the money and did all the drinking and what sexing and whatever he did. And then he realized something's still missing. Something's not here that I thought I was going to get by doing and having all those experiences. And that's the turning point where we realize there's got to be another way. There's got to be something different than what I've been grasping for within the context of this little square box that I'm living in. And that's what begins to open us up to this wonderful chart that makes us really crazy. <laughs> uh, look at all the things of, that I do to protect myself, to protect this, this, this side. About 99.9% right. 
to Santa Barbara Day evolves right. around the little character called the hero of the dream. Absolutely. Right. right. And again, it was set up that way so that our focal point would remain very stuck in taking care of business the best I can within right. the, the efforts. Of so I wouldn't go on the other side. Big hole on the other side, yes. You've done a good job. Yep. And <laughs> this doesn't provide any services for this character called me, because there isn't a me over here on top of that. Okay. Well, who wants to run to that until this becomes so intolerable that we're willing to give it a shot? Well, everything I do in this world is all about the body. And that if I'm not the body, then, it, then why am I doing all this stuff? You know? Because we don't believe that yet. Right, right. And we don't trust it yet. So, yeah. And, and it's all about the body. Protecting the body. Me, the body. <laughs> right. Yep. All right, and then that final italicized place, and I will not use my own past learning as the light to guide me now. So basically he's saying, drop your investment in thinking you know anything. Well, isn't that a delightful little line? No, not for my ego, it's not. That's totally nuts. Not only, even if I start to conceptually understand it, being able to do it just like that is, going to take a whole lot of practice going on here. All right, so he goes on to say, um, by this refusal to attempt to teach yourself what you do not know, the guide whom God has given you will speak to you. So when we eventually do, even for a second, and you know, the holy instant is an instant, it's not, you know, the rest of my life, it's this instant, and you know, the Course talks a great deal about the idea of the little willingness. In this one little instant, am I willing to drop this to find out his play? And that's literally the practice throughout because there's only one instant I can work on in any given instant anyways. But how many instances will I spend over here versus how many I will feed for this? All right, he will take his rightful place in your awareness the instant you abandon it and offer it to him. And again, be very aware, just because I drop this and choose this doesn't mean the fireworks of isn't this wonderful and more that where are the angels is gonna show up in your life. But something has shifted and something has changed. So before I go on, I want to what bubbled up for me this week is, you know, think about this hero is, you know, I think when we think of a word, a hero, we think of Superman or something like that. But literally, this is the main character of your dream, okay? You're in your dream all the time, and you're being affected by what takes place within the context of your dream. So let's think of being a a, an actor in a movie and the, what popped in my mind was Tom Hanks. Okay. So we know Tom Hanks has been a actor for many, many years. He's played many, many different parts. He actually, whether you know this or not, did a lot of the Shakespeare in Lakewood high school back in the day when uh, there were Shakespeare plays being done and he would, their practice was at Lakewood high school where I happened to have gone to high school. I never saw him play at that time, but that's where he did practice. He's been in movies that are humorous or very serious or very practical or whatever, but in every single one of the movies he's in, he's the main character. He's the hero of the dream. And for those of you who saw the movie Forrest Gump, let's say, Forrest Gump was the main character. The entire story of that movie had to do with Forrest Gump and his reaction, his experiences, what took place in his life throughout that movie. But when Tom Hanks went home at night, he wasn't Forrest Gump, right? But within the context of the movie or the dream or the experience that he played out in that movie, he was totally focused on the relationship with what was going on in his experience within that movie. And if we take the movie Castaway, if you happen to have seen that movie, 
he was really the main character in that movie because there was nothing else in the movie but him being, um, you know, shipwrecked and being the only character except for Wilson, the little, um, was it a basketball that he made his companion. But it wasn't even a real person. Well, we have literally done that very thing by playing our part in this silly play that we've experienced. Only we keep forgetting to go home at night to be reminded of who we really are. We took on this identity and we have stuck with this identity for eons of time. And when God comes along or the Holy Spirit comes along and says, hey, there's another, another way to go over here. Come on back home. We go, huh? Oh yeah, that, yeah, okay, I'll see you guys later. I gotta come back over here and play the part that is who I think I am. And everything about who we are and what we experience and what we live is centered around here. I was hoping that I wonder if uh, Tom Hanks, after he played all these parts, if uh, if, uh, if all these parts didn't make him confused in his mind of who am I? You know, am I this? Am I that? That like, that might that might have been very confusing. Right, right, right. But I think we're all confused, Bob, whether we're consciously aware of it or not. And in regard to the different movies I I shared. Think about this as, let's say each one of those movies was a different life, okay, of which, well, whether you believe in reincarnation or not, I'm not going to dump that on you, but if you do believe in reincarnation, think about each of the movies he played in where he was a different character, was a different lifetime, okay? Now, I'm sure, or I'm, I know I've read, and maybe you have as well, that sometimes a character in a movie you know, like a physical movie is not a very nice character. And I have heard of those actors being on the street where people will come up to them and yell at them for the character that they played in the movie, okay? Because the characters in our movies play those parts as well. But it's all just simply a play, an illusion. It's not real. So what we're being asked to do is to keep observing ourselves from here as a character in the dream in relationship to all the stuff that's going on within our dream or movie as we're talking about here and observe it and stop being so identified with the character called the hero. And as we begin to observe the character called Mary Ann, in relationship to the world. I'm not so identified with the character called Mary Ann who's playing out this particular part. And when we can come to the place where we can observe from afar and not judge or condemn anything that goes on here, simply observe the insanity of having chosen the separated experience and what the results are, have given us, it will eventually dawn on us, duh, I don't think I want to play over here anymore. This is not providing me what I want because now I want peace above all else that's taking place within this silly dream that we are so addicted to and so attached to. So I think if you look at it from that perspective, it helps to kind of separate from, you know, being the me, me, me aspect of the character who is not even who you, you, you is. <laughs> because we're really one son in the expression of love that's eternal and totally who we are. All the rest of it brings all of this and it's what is what we've gotten so used to that this is foreign. And, that, and Helene said, you know, when you come over here and you start speaking from here and you go, whoa, 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 who's talking? That's not me. Because you've gotten out of the way. It's very uncomfortable. It's very startling initially. But as we become more comfortable with it, this becomes the automatic and it flows from a place where we don't interfere any longer but it's a process, a very gradual process for us to come to that awareness. So each time we step over here, we're becoming more aligned with this. And every instant we're here, you're not over here, so you're not continuing to feed this. And when you take on the identity of the character called me, and you're not the observer, 
this just feeds this full time. So now we're kind of here where we're here and then we're here and then we're here and we're here and we're here. Eventually we're gonna spend a whole lot more time here and a lot less time here. And when we do that, we're not rolling out the carpet of time because when we're here, time is not running the show. And yeah. thank you, Oma Mary. And that that, that, that kind of hit, hit a spot uh, in my mind. Like, like, if, like we're told on the reincarnation that we have been born thousands of times. Okay. And, 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 and therefore, every person and everything I see is really me in, in a different life. <laughs> Yeah. I'm still yeah. playing a different part. That is correct, Bob. And But understand, think about going up into the attic, and the attic is totally black, and you have a flashlight, and you shine that flashlight in one little section in the corner. You could say, that's my lifetime this time. So all I know of within the context of that is what's being, what my flashlight is showing. But the whole attic is full of all these other lifetimes. And the next time you come up, you might shine it over here. And that's the lifetime you play. And while you're in that lifetime, of course, you're the hero of that particular dream. And you're going to only know the experiences that go on from there. But this type of a thinking has helped me to, to uh, accept people. Because I can look and say, I don't like that person, but at one time I was that person. So it just, just helps me to accept uh, that person. Yes, beautiful. I, I was thinking that it gives, it gives a direction uh, to discouragement when you feel discouraged. It, it's yeah. uh, those kind of words, depressed, depressed and discouraged by circumstances. It, it gives you another direction. It gives you, uh, um, uh, you know, like you, you can go there and, and let go of the discouragement. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that doesn't see in the world doesn't seem to to exist at all. It, there's no everything looks like something like a piece of candy uh, uh, to me. And then it turns out to not to be just the opposite. So um, that kind of um, uh, feeling of, of being let let down and and you know how can the world be this way how can that person be so stupid and how can you know all those kind of questions um are allowed to you know to to be aired and to then to ask the holy spirit to show me wh what what's what you know not not to say to the holy spirit why am i uh but but please help me to not please help me about this. You know, what is there about this that you can do when nobody else can and, and nobody else seems like they're on the same, even on the same planet with me? Yep. Well, and you were talking about the candy. Well, literally, when we're playing the part of the hero of the dream, we're looking for pieces of candy or something to substitute God's love. And yes, compared to the quote unquote negative aspect of my world, some of the things within the context of my world are much more comfortable, much more fun, much more whatever. But none of them replace the true connection with the love of God. And as we begin to realize, yeah, it's nice I have that new car, or I had a nice meal, whatever, but I still have that lack within me that is not being fulfilled by any of the substitutes in the world that I have desperately attempted to fill myself up with in some form or another. You know, with the meal, I might gain five pounds by the morning or whatever, and then the downside of that experience happens. So there's, you know, every, every substitute within the context of the setup of the world has some kind of a downside. And this one doesn't, but we have to be willing to relinquish our attachment again, only for an instant to find out what the result of that is. And I do want to just throw in real quickly, I did mention reincarnation. Um, if anybody has an issue with reincarnation, there's actually, I think, only a couple places in the course where uh, Jesus speaks of reincarnation and in the teacher's manual, it specifically states that you don't, understanding or believing in reincarnation is not a requirement for studying the course. Um, and, but if, if you do accept that as a possibility, it can be helpful to understand 
And there are places in the course where it might say a holy instant is an ancient place where, or excuse me, is a place where an ancient hate turned into a present love. So, but again, at the same time, if you aren't comfortable with reincarnation, don't let that be a reason not to continue to practice or study the course. Uh, yeah. uh, that, uh, one time that Ken Wapnick was um, interviewed by a person and they had asked him if he believes in reincarnation and the Ken Wapnick had says yes, but he had decided not to go that, that mm -hmm. way. Right. Okay. So at this time, I want to just read one quick little paragraph from workbook lesson number four. And the workbook uh, title is God Did Not Create a Meaningless World. And in paragraph one, it says the idea for today is, of course, the reason why a meaningless world is impossible. What God did not create does not exist. And back to Dawn's question, the Course would state what God created is here. What took place after the separation has nothing to do with God's creation. And what this is saying is what God did not create does not exist. And everything that does exist as, and everything that does exist is, is as he created it. The world you see has nothing to do with reality. It is of your own making and it does not exist. Well, again, that's a nice little paragraph, but how many of us can really gulp that in and take that in as our understanding? And I would say, even if we might intellectually understand it, it's still a very difficult concept to embrace. But, if we think of it as a, you know, a, a direction we want to walk towards of, okay, Holy Spirit, show me what you mean by the statement that the world I see has nothing to do with reality. Because in my experience, it has everything to do with reality. And there is nothing outside of the reality that, again, in this paragraph, he says, it is your own making and it does not exist. And if we think about the idea of a nighttime dream, we all know you have a dream. You wake up in the morning, all the characters in your dream have disappeared. Where did they go and where were they when you were dreaming? They were in your mind. And when we have chosen for the ego, what is in our mind? It is the opposite of what we are guilt set and fear kill or be killed the belief in separation that then it's projected into the world where we now believe that the characters in the dream that i'm having are real and what this is saying is no they're not real no matter how solid no matter how real our experience appears to be in this world he's trying to help us understand that this is simply an illusion that has no effect whatsoever on who and what you are in reality. But that's a, a truth we will eventually grow into. It's not something most of us can live at this moment. So we you know, keep practicing, keep studying, keep trying to embrace these concepts very slowly oftentimes because they are totally, you know, talk about mind blowing. They are totally mind blowing from where most of us are still sitting. But it's a possibility that wasn't even available when we were brain dead, as, as Jason was talking about a few minutes ago. There was no possibility of escape from this storyline as it was set up. But there is a possibility now. Any comments? Mary Ann, um, could you say? Go ahead, Bianca. Oh. Could you say that the only, the only thing that is real is what never would change? Absolutely correct. If, if it changes at any time, that is not real. Correct. So it, there, there are very few things that fit into that category of what is real. Exactly. And nothing that has form is real as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
And again, well, that's real nice. Thank you very much. I think I have to go somewhere else and play because that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for make my little world a little bit better here. And instead he does this that. Well, initially that's pretty threatening for most people. But as again, we keep practicing and understanding it on a deeper level, the understanding of how great that news is will eventually dawn on you, I promise. It, it will happen. But initially, that's probably not where most of us will find ourselves. Okay, Helene, go for it. Yeah, just, just that what the, what the course does is it offers us an opportunity to see things differently. Yes, what we see in the world is meaningless, you know, dot, dot, dot. And I can choose to see this differently by taking it to the Holy Spirit, letting go of it and saying, you know, choose for God for me, as the atonement prayer says. Because I, I don't know what, what this, I don't know what this means. Correct. And, you know, I think one of the beauties of a paragraph that I just read is that we, it's almost startling, but it's very important that it's startling because if I um, attach myself to any aspect of what's going on in the world as being real, I'm not going to eventually apply this to the degree that it's being asked to apply to. And, you know, one of the workbook lessons, it says, walk, you know, go around the room, this means nothing, that means nothing. And then it, it specifically states that you don't have to do every single thing in the room, but let's say you have a picture of your child or maybe your child sitting next to you. You have to include that as well. Well, I don't want to know that my child is not real. In the context of the illusion, obviously, to me, my child is extremely real. But in the higher level of understanding complete oneness, my child is a separated being, is no more real than the character called me playing the part of Mary Turner. And, you know, he's constantly, I guess you could say, upgrading our understanding so that we can get that we have chosen to live in a lacking a, a unloving, you know, kill or be killed world of which we cling to a couple of nice things and we go, isn't this a wonderful place? When in truth, we could have an entire experience that's totally loving and totally connecting and totally, you know, unchangeable and all the, and peaceful. But we continue to play within the arena of this insanity. And the only thing that's real is love. And the only thing, as Beata was saying, there's not a whole lot in the world to choose from that would take you here. And the answer is the only real thing is when you, you know, clean your hands and say, show me what love or show me what peace is. And, you know, most of us probably aren't spiritually mature to do that 24 hours a day. So you observe yourself playing the part of not choosing that all the time, but you at it and you go well of course I wouldn't choose that because I'm not ready to choose that right now and you become much more gentle with yourself in the process of the unfolding of the way the course um, will lead you because initially you'll think oh I'm doing the course and I'm supposed to just be loving all the time and oh I just wasn't loving and then you browbeat yourself or hate yourself or you think you've done something wrong and he's saying Step above the battleground, observe the insanity of the battleground, but observe it from a place of non-judgment or non-attack in regard to it. Then we don't feed the illusion. When I resist the illusion, I'm literally giving it power because I'm back down here trying to figure out how to manipulate the illusion. And um, Marianne? Yeah. Um, so I'm just thinking of how um, my family situations were, were just pivotal to me about these things because um, that arena of, of um, I'm, I'm wrong, they're right, or they're wrong, I'm right, um, is just kind of this, this um, you know, this kind of a merry-go-round to be on for so long and then to have, you know, have the holidays come up and uh, go through this again. This one says this, this one says that. And um, 
I found that to be the excellent proving ground for the Holy Spirit, because when I finally said, I don't know anything here, um, and especially, you know, a, a very important time when, you know, um, my, you know, there were decisions made about what my mother was going to do, if she was going to go to this nursing home or not, and how, you um, it seems like those other characters pull, pulled me into the conversation where I had to take sides. Mm -hmm. And I just remember saying, okay, Jesus, this is, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. Help me. I, I'm not, I'm not going to take sides. I mean, I, I, I found myself finding that, that like I, I, I told myself I'm not going to take sides. I want the Holy Spirit to show me right now where are you in this situation? And I really felt that I was, um, you know, it really, I proved it. I, I wanted to prove it. I said, you know, that's it. I, I can't, I don't want to argue. I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel like I don't belong. I don't want these feelings anymore. And then to have it lifted um, was like, it was, it was like, that's what I, I expected. I waited. I said, okay, if this is what Jesus offers, I'm going to take Jesus's offer and I'm not going to, and it was, you know, it's, it's really interesting how it, how you feel crazy. Um, but like taking a stand, um, for Jesus took me out of everything else, it took me out of the, any decisions, just took me like, okay, I'm, I'm sitting right here waiting for, for that answer. Um, and, and that's, um, you know, like, like how, you, how you get excited about it and want it, it is pivotal to what you get. Yeah. And how much, you, how much you need it, you know, in a situation will really, uh, that's what has to drive you. Um, otherwise, it just sounds like uh, nice things you, you might want to try, you know, at home next week, you know, or whatever. <laughs> when you get around to it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 It, you've got to be serious. I mean, this has to be what your choice is. And there's a line that in the course where it talks about the idea, if you want the peace of God, it's yours. But you have to really want it above everything else. You know, I can't, I can't play the part of I'm going to be right and, and be choosing for peace. I have to wash my hands thinking I know what anything is for or what it, you know, why it's here or how it's going to be healed. How can I know when I don't even know what the problem is? You know, the whole camouflage was let's stay focused here. This is where the problem is. This is not where the problem is. This has nothing to do with the problem. But boy, it sure has been the focal point in our, you know, our whole life. And he's saying, no, there's another thing here to look at, guys. You haven't got the whole picture. Let me show you the whole picture. And it's not like our problems are going to go away. No. There's always another layer. And it's not like I'm going to like wake up and all my problems are going to be dissolved or anything like that. It, it's just that it gives me another way to look at things so that not as much suffering is involved correct not that we don't go through the suffering you know to get to that place because that's part of the program and you just have to be willing to do it you have to be willing to look at whatever shows up and what helene was saying is absolutely correct and oftentimes when we first start the course, there's a honeymoon period and things really seem to get nicer. And then the stuff hits the fan. And then we find out that there's some great resistance internally that in fact, the course talks about it. The ego can become vicious, if not malicious. And that's not the ego with a power of the power we've given it. We've given it the power to run the show. Now we're saying, no, 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 I'm gonna give it that power to God. And the ego says, well, wait a minute, you've already ordered this, so let me bring it to your door. And the question always comes to, do I want peace above everything else? It's like we're being asked to step off the cliff, and maybe we'll sprout wings, and maybe we'll fall flat on our face, but it's not my business. 
That is correct. But right now, most of us still think it's our business. Yeah. <laughs> We're all yeah, yeah. thrilled about that jumping thing. But yes, correct. Yeah. I mean, how do you have faith in something that you can't see, feel, or touch? That's telling you the opposite of what your life experience is. Yeah, one minute I'm going, bring it, bring it. And oh, then no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> All right, so I have another little thing to read, and this one is in workbook lesson 13, and it says, the title is A Meaningless World Engenders Fear. And I really love the description of this to help you understand pretty much what we were talking about today. So recognition of meaninglessness arouses intense anxiety in all the separated ones. That would be us. It represents a situation in which God and the ego challenge each other as to whose meaning is to be written in the empty space that the meaninglessness provides. And I'm going to read this line by line when I get done, by the way. The ego rushes in frantically to establish its own ideas there, fearful that the void may otherwise be used to demonstrate its own impotence and unreality. And on this alone, it is correct. So let me go through that line by line. So mean recognition of meaninglessness arouses intense anxiety in all the separated ones. And we're all the little separated one, ones that believe they're separated. Maybe that's a better way to say it. And yes, meaninglessness of my world, which is, as Bob said, we, you know, how much of our focus is on the illusion in my world is 99.99% .99 of my life experience on planet earth. And then someone comes along and said, it's all meaningless. You know, that is not going to be experienced as a very comfortable situation for us that are still very addicted to the illusion. But again, he's presenting these concepts, these ideas, knowing very well that of course we're not going to jump on this and understand it completely. But that if he says it enough times, eventually it'll start to dawn on us why that's valuable, why that's important, and that that is ultimately my gift and my salvation and my way home. It represents a situation in which God and the ego challenge each other as to, who, as to whose meaning will be written in the empty space that the meaninglessness provides. So literally what that represents is either this is gonna fill the empty space or this is gonna fill the empty space. There are no other choices. It's simple in that respect, this or this. And you could think of it, well, maybe we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take the throne. You know, who's going to sit on the throne? Is it going to be this or is it going to be this? Each moment, we're choosing what we want. Only we chose this, we mind melded with this, and we've been living under these roles since the Big Bang, not being aware that that's what we set into motion. So now the answer is provided and you can drop this and choose this and you'll be shown a totally different experience when you're ready to choose for it. Okay, but again, one every moment has this possibility, every single instant. So he goes on to say, the ego rushes in frantically to establish its own ideas there, fearful that the boy may otherwise be used to demonstrate its impotence and its unreality. Well, of course, we're going to run in and fill the space with this because this is all I think I know. This is my, this is my salvation as a separated son. And as I sometimes talk about the idea, if you're on this team, this team is not really your friend. It's just like the football game. You know, if you're on the red team, the blue team is not your bud while you're playing the game. Well, while we're playing the game of I'm the separated son of God, the whispers of truth are not taken in particularly from a place of I'm so excited, <laughs> especially when we really start to understand what he's really 
saying and that the answer will require that I let this go. But again, when the, the point comes in your life experiences where you can't tolerate this any longer, something within the context of this reveals your understanding that this is not bringing me the peace and the love and the connection that I thought it was going to bring to me. Somewhat like what Andrea was saying before she came to the course, she knew the world wasn't providing her with the answers that she was looking for. So she was ripe, she was open to another possibility, whatever the heck that meant. So she was willing to take the practice of the course and put it into her daily life experiences. All right, so he says, and on this alone, it is correct. So it is true that when we don't have this here and on the empty space, the answer over here is going to fill that space. And the answer that fills that space will ultimately take me to a place where I am no longer the hero of the dream. Because in oneness, there is all, not all these splintered off heroes. The only way I can be a special hero is to have my own little world where I'm the king or the queen. I can't have that in the world of oneness. But I can't have love. I can't have connection. I can't have changelessness. I can't have eternity either. What do I get? Birth or death here. And then I say I don't like it but I'm not willing to drop it to find out what eternity really is until I mature to the point where this no longer feeds me. All right, paragraph three. It is essential, therefore, that you learn to recognize the meaningless, excuse me, the meaningless and accept it without fear. If you are fearful, it is certain that you will endow the world with attributes that it does not possess and crowd it with images that do not exist. The ego illusions are safety devices as they must also be to you who equate yourself with the ego. All right, so it is essential therefore that you learn to recognize the meaningless and accept it without fear. Well, initially it's not going to be accepted without fear, but Again, as we open to this possibility more and more, we can then begin to realize how meaningless the world is, and it won't engender the fear to the degree it did as you walked in the door and you first understood these concepts. But that's going to be a very gradual process because I am so addicted to this. If you are fearful, it is certain that you will endow the world with attributes that it does not possess and crowd it with images that do not exist. So if I'm reading the course, but I'm still afraid of what the course offers, I'm going to very quickly run back to the images of the separateness because I'm too uncomfortable with the image of letting myself go or letting my I'm right, or I know, or any of those concepts that so many of us still cling to, desperately, literally. And then this last line, do the ego illusions are safety devices, as they must also be to you who equate yourself with the ego. And I have said this for years, that the world is a um, security blanket until I'm ready to align with this. This is where I get to hide and be justified of being an innocent victim until I'm really ready to understand that this really gives me nothing. All it does is perpetuates a thought system of I'm the opposite of what I really am. And when that dawns on me and I am willing to drop a moment of time and experience to have it filled in with his answer, then we'll start cooking here. And I think it's really important for us to also realize that the ultimate position of choosing this is there's no me. But in the progression of continually choosing, there's going to be less fear, there's going to be less anxiety, there's going to be less, um, you know, of all the things that the ego world attributes itself to be those will begin to diminish. 
your desire for kill or be killed, or I've got to be right, or I'm going to show that person, will slowly be replaced by an awareness of why would I want to make my brother wrong so that I can be all right. And it will begin to dawn on you intellectually, and then eventually you'll be able to apply it in a more experiential way where your, your natural response is going to be, you know, punch out their lights, and suddenly a thought will enter your awareness of, wait a minute, is that really what I want to do? But again, that's a process, a very long process for most of us. But at least there is a process now. Because before, all I had to work with was this little tiny square of which the answer didn't even lie. And so Marianne? Good, yes. Um, and it works because I, I had an experience of just what you said. And, and it's just a small example, but yep. so helpful um, at work. And this one customer is, is a jerk. I mean, it's everyone's consensus that has dealt with him. Um, and he needed, he needed material that, that we had, but he doesn't buy it from us. He buys it from another company. Well, the other company doesn't have it. <laughs> and I was joining in with this because my coworkers were like, good. He's, he's not taking our, our stock. So, you know, he can't have it. And good for him because he's such a jerk and blah, blah, blah. And I, I jumped in on that for a few moments. And then it dawned on me. He's afraid. You know, whatever he, you know, his, his production's going to shut down without this. And people are going to be laid off and blah, blah, blah. He's, he's, he's afraid. Why, you know, why wouldn't we, you know, sell him what he needs? And, and, and yeah, it just saw the whole thing. Yep. And, and that's just a small example, but it works. The course works when you work it. Yep. It's just that little shift in perception of seeing your brother, not from a place of kill or be killed, but as he's a child you know, looking for love. And he's afraid. And it's just so amazing when those veils fall and you see your brother from a totally different perspective, it's just, it, you know, sometimes can bring tears to your eyes of realizing he's just a, afraid, a frightened child calling for love. And at this moment, you had something that you could offer him to appease his pain a bit. But be very aware, you know, as, as Rose shared that story, you know, he's a jerk. Well, in the worldly sense, we could get a bazillion people to line up behind all the people that Rose works with that would say he is a jerk, but he still belongs over here and not over here. And what, you know, that, that jerkness that he's playing in that part is no different than if Tom Hanks was playing a part of a, a like, a bad person, you know, he, I actually looked online to see if he was in any, um, any movies where he was the, the, the bad guy or the dark character, and he really doesn't play many of those characters. I guess he did play a couple. But in the content of the, the storyline, somebody's got to play the bad guy. And if I'm playing the innocent victim, it's got to be the other guy. And yet, they're worthy of love just as much as I'm worthy of love. Yes, and in that moment, too, and I find this helpful, and it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but um, when I think he's a jerk, I'm a jerk. Because I'm coming from a place of hate. I have to if I think he's a jerk. Exactly. Yep. And I think in this process, again, we're going to start with my worldly experiences. And Rose feels like she's Rose a body, and he's the jerk in a body, too. So we're going to start with that experience. That's just going to be what's there. But somehow, because I'm sure of your practice of the course, the awareness dawned on your mind because you spend a little more time over here of, wait, yeah, he's acting like a jerk. His part in the play is he's a jerk. But he's, all, he's a lot more than that. And if I want to find out who I am, not as a jerk, 
I have to be ready and willing to drop my investment in him being a jerk and allow the Holy Spirit to fill in that empty space to see that we're really both coming from a place of love. And, and the kicker is, and it's a lie. And it's a lie. No, well, it's also a lie because he's never been a jerk with me. I've never had that experience with him. Okay. So I'm just buying into what other people are saying about the guy. I have, I've had very little experience with him and what I've had has been fine. So, you know, there's, there's another layer of it. And the beat goes on, right? Right, right. It's, it's nuts. It <clears throat> makes no sense when you really look at it. Yes, yes. And again, because, because you don't, you don't really know him at all. I don't. I have no it's, idea who this person is. Ex except through your own judgment of my what story. you think of how it yes, would be Yes, my for you. story, which comes That's from somebody else's story. It's about what you... It's not even my story. How it would be for you. What? If you were acting that way, that's you would be a jerk in your own mind. And all these little subtle storylines are going on in our all life experiences all the time, all the time. And in, until we can rise above and start to become a little bit more aware of what's going on and examine the situation, will we ever come to an awareness of something different than what our eyes are are honed in on, that our eyes were trained to see through those lenses because of the choice for the ego. It's a total setup. Every ounce of everything within the illusion is a setup that um, perpetuates the illusion. So Marianne, I, I have a question about this, this idea. So um, let's say we take the concept of despair, right? In the illusion, there's this concept of despair. Correct. But that concept of despair manifests in 500 people, in mm -hmm. 500 events, mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's, I mean, we talk about there's, there's only one of us. Correct. There's only one of us here, but one of us might be experiencing despair, which means it's affecting 500 puppets. Correct. Is that, is that a kind of correct way to think that, about that this? Yeah, correct. That would be a correct line. Yes. Um, and not only is it um, affecting all those people because, you know, we're either feeding this or we're feeding this. That's all there is to choose from. Right. Well, let's say in that contents, um, context, uh, Jason gets that that's just a projection of the illusion and he drops it and chooses for this and you could think about this is the spokes of the wheel and one of those little things Jason is sort of erased a little bit of that that has affected not just Jason it has affected every single relationship Jason has and it's affected the world because Jason didn't feed this he chose to feed this which is the disappearance of the belief in this so it's like literally every, every moment any one of us choose for love instead of feeding the ego, it's a healing experience for ourselves. And the, you know, the Course even talks about the idea of you're not only healing the present, you're healing the past and the future. <laughs> well, that's pretty hard to wrap your head around. But that's because you're, you're dissipating the connection with the ego or the, the thought system of the ego and what we experience as the world. And again, that, this is none of my business how this gets worked out. I just need to drop this and choose for this. And then however it turns out is like literally not my business, but it will begin to shift and change. And that doesn't mean as Helene said earlier, it doesn't mean your whole world's going to turn out to be this wonderful, delicious experience. You know, we take Jesus from the course. His last moments were dying on the cross, having his clothes ripped off him and people spitting on him and calling him names and all kinds of experiences. But his mind was aligned with truth. So what took place within the world or with his body had no effect on him any longer. Well, we're still identified with this character called me. So it still does have an effect on me. 
But as we keep choosing for this, what happens on the outside becomes less and less important because I'm connected more and more with the correct part of my mind that knows none of the, real, the illusions real anyway. And you know, Jesus does talk about the idea that the, the, the journey to the cross was the, the final journey and, it, and we don't have to play in that particular journey. But he also explains that every single time in any moment in your day where you feel bad, where you feel stupid, where you feel angry, where you feel like kill or be killed, you are on the cross. And you're playing out this thought system versus this thought system. And again, it's hard to look at, but very valuable information. Because if I start to realize what the choice and what the effect the choice has brought me, and I become aware that, that I'm not really enjoying the effect like I thought I was. You know, we chose this because we thought we were getting a good deal. You know, we thought we got the blue light special at the Kmart or whatever, but it didn't work out that way. We got to be an individual special and different, but we also lost our connection with the love. And when we finally dawns on us that, you know, I really want to reconnect with that love. I'm tired of making my brother guilty so that I can play the part of an innocent victim, which is exactly what we set up when we made this, um, once that choice was taken seriously, and we couldn't tolerate the guilt, sin, and fear. So I'm going to be an innocent victim, even though I know I'm, a, you know, the Son of God is the guilty one that chose this in the first place. But even that's not real, because it's all part of the illusion. But if we believe it's real, we will reap the effects of that belief until we don't believe it anymore. Marianne, um, what you're saying is taking me back to what Rose was describing before about judging, you know, whomever as a jerk, but going on hearsay rather than my own personal experience. And I guess where I'm taking that is, okay, if I'm doing that with this guy or whoever I'm calling a, a jerk currently, what else am I doing this same thing with? Yes. You know, and it's the whole, it gets me to look at that whole ego thought system as something, <laughs> you know, that, like what it said in lesson four, that the meaninglessness of it all. Yes. And, and to kind of tie that into what Jason was saying is that, that um, I was listening to an interview with Viktor Frankl today, and he said that despair is suffering without meaning. And I don't think he meant the world's meaning. I think the meaning that we come to, that we recognize is within us. Right, right, right. Yeah, I would think he, would, he, he was coming from that kind of understanding, a much, yes. much broader sense than the average person back at that time, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think the beauty, again, of this is as we begin to heal this, literally we're healing aspects of all of this. And I don't even have to work on the rest of them. That one aspect of healing heals the rest of them. And then the next layer will come, and the next layer, and the next layer. And it literally heals everything that I'm looking at through my lens as the ego, because I'm I'm literally erasing or dissipating my attachment or connection with this. And, you know, it's like this slowly has less and less value to it. You know, in the, in the uh, teacher's manual, it talks about the levels of development and it talks about or the development of trust, I'm sorry. And it talks about what we value. Well, originally we value everything and then eventually we don't value as many things, but it keeps stepping down to the point where you realize nothing of this world has value to me any longer. Now the person sitting next to me may be very enmeshed in the value of the world, but from my perspective, that will have dissipated and now I'm literally living in a different world, a different experience. And that's a good thing. <laughs> it takes a little practice getting there, but it's, it's pretty amazing when it begins to happen. And in taking a Rose's story again with the jerk, I mean, 
once you recognize, wow, I not only let the jerk off the hook, I literally let myself off the hook. And, and the awareness of that shift internally is going to want you to do that more frequently because that's a freeing experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we pay such a <coughs> price to keep this going. We not only make ourselves guilty, we make our brother guilty. All right, mm -hmm. so we're going to go back to 297, paragraph 7. And before I even go on to that, um, you know, if some of you have seen the movie The Truman Show, and, you know, we've talked about this before, where Truman was the main character. He was the hero of the, of the show, and he didn't even know he was the hero of the show. Well, we don't even know we're the hero of the show. But occasionally, certain things got exposed where he started to get little you know, little gems of awareness that something's not right here. This is not as solid as I thought it was. Well, as we begin to choose, because now we, I guess you could say consciously have an awareness that I can drop this and choose this, then this becomes the, the, the reflection of love starts to bring more and more of those openings in our cracks of awareness of that this isn't so solid like I thought it was. And that's a you know, wonderful reflection of the healing that we have put forth. All right, so paragraph number seven. I guess that's on 298. You cannot be your guide to miracles for it is you who made them necessary. And because you did, the means on which you can depend for miracles has been provided for you. God's son can make no needs his father will not meet if he but turn to him ever so little. Yet he cannot compel his son to turn to him and remain himself, capital H. It is impossible that God lose his identity, for if he did, you would lose yours. And being yours, he cannot change himself, for your identity is changeless. The miracle acknowledges his changelessness by seeing his son as he always was and not how he would make himself. The miracle brings the effects that only guiltlessness can bring and thus establishes the fact that guiltlessness must, excuse me, guiltlessness must be. All right, so once again, Jesus in this paragraph is trying to help us understand you as the hero of the dream or the character in the dream over here are not going to ever be able to figure out what's wrong or how to fix it. Impossible, no answer available, isn't going to happen. It is only when we step out of the way and allow his answer to come forth that we will have access to the truth versus what we have set up. So you cannot be your guide to miracles, for it is you who made them necessary. I made the need to find a way to get back to miracles by having chosen for the ego. Now there's a problem that seems to be having a need to be solved. Before, there wasn't a problem that needed to be solved because I was just aligned with oneness. Because you did, in other words, because we did make it necessary, um, the means on which you can depend for miracles has been provided for you. you. You don't have the answers. He does have the answers. God's son can make no needs his father will not meet if he but turned to him ever so little. Now, the challenge with that sentence is, is it makes it sound like God's going to come down and fix my world. Okay? But that's not really what it means. It means if you open to show me who I really am, show me who my brother really is, your answer will come. It's not going to fix the world in the way that you might, as an ego, wish for your world to be fixed. Even though it makes it sound, God's son can make no needs, his father will not meet. That sounds like everything I want. Bring it on down, God. I've asked for it. Where is it? And I can't remember who mentioned it near the beginning of the class, 
of one of the reasons they chose to look beyond their understanding of the world was because God wasn't playing his part. He wasn't bringing me my shiny red truck or whatever it was that I thought I wanted. So I, I got an issue with God now. But he will bring you the peace that you choose for, and that it will be unequivocal. All right, so the next line says, he cannot compel his son to turn to him and remain himself. Basically what that means is, the Holy Spirit God will remain over here with his hands out, ready to receive us at any time we choose to ask to connect with him. But he can't make us do that. He can't come down and say, come on over here where you belong. We have to make that choice, that decision on our own to drop this and choose for this. And again, he couldn't remain what he is if he came into the dream that's made up. He only knows of what is true, what he created, what's valuable. He's not going to come and play over here because that would lessen who he is, which is impossible for him to do. God, oh, let's see. It is impossible that God lose his identity, for if he did, you would lose yours. And basically what he's saying there is, you really haven't lost your identity. You only think you lost your identity by playing in the arena of the illusion. But nothing about the illusion is real. You know, throughout the course in many, many, many places, Jesus will say, it appears there are two choices, the egos and the Holy Spirit. And then he will go on and say, but in truth, there's really only one. So this one isn't even valuable or valid because it's just an illusion. So an illusion can't have any effects. But to the degree we accept it, believe it, and live it, we will have the experience of it being real to us. And you know, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that when Jesus got this, he took all of us with him. Well, in his mind, we are all healed and we are all with him. In our minds, depending on what we choose to align with, we will reap the effects of whatever it is we're holding in our thought system. But who we really are has never changed, will never change, and is always available when we are ready. Yada, I remember you had your hand up a long time ago and I never addressed it. Did you get your question? Oh, I don't even know. I apologize. I don't. I'm oh, not... please. Yeah, I usually. Oh, post... no, no I... problem. Okay. But... I, I moved to the couch to lay down. Okay. All right. Enjoy it, girl. <laughs> okay. Uh... <coughs> okay. So. Again, in being yours, he cannot change himself for your identity is changeless. So again, our identity remains changeless. Even though we're playing in the belief in the arena of the ego, we're still at home in the loving arms of God. Good news, guys. We couldn't mess that part up because if we could have, we would have. All right. So the miracle acknowledges his changelessness by seeing his son as he always was and not as he would make himself. So the miracle acknowledges that nothing ever happened to change who and what you are. Again, even if we still believe it has. So yeah. if you say, Marianne, if you yeah. say, show me who I am, right? Yeah. You're still an I at that point, right? Well, so how, how do you get out of that? Okay, that's a good question. But if you're asking to be shown what, maybe asking to be shown what you are is better than what I am, but whatever, those are just words. But if you're understanding that when I ask that question, I want my investment and belief in Jasonness to be removed and be filled in by my understanding of what I, what, it, what my identity really is instead of my identity as an individual. Okay. And again, we use these words, you know, it's just, it's just our language, but we don't have a word for it. Basically. We don't have a word, we for, it, basically. We don't have a word for it. Correct. And it's more like the intent of, I know this isn't working. You show me what works. 
All right. Okay. So, the, okay. The miracle brings the effect that only guiltlessness can bring and thus establishes the fact that guiltlessness must be. And understand, even with that sentence, what does that mean? That means we live in a world of guilt. Guilt, sin, and fear. Those are the foundational stones of this thought system. Plus, it's the total, complete, and opposite of what we are. That's big, guys. That's heavy duty. And we live in this experience thinking, oh, it's not really too bad. I think I'll stay a little bit longer. Not the unbeknownst to us that what remains on the other side is like a bazillion times better than what we're experiencing. But in our limited understanding, we're going to cling to the things that seem to be nice in our world until we get in a place where we're really willing to drop it. Find out where the answers are instead of ours. Any quick comment before we close? Um, just that that, that, that that feeling that, having that um, question and then having it answered by God is like nothing you'll ever think it could ever be. And it's such a quiet thing that just says, see, here I am. And I'm, you know, with it, it's a moment, the holy answer or whatever, where you're just, any thinking you could ever have about it has no bearing on the thing at all. And it just is gone into this place of peace. Correct. Yes. It's and amazing. It's so often people will do their best to describe an experience of a holy instant. And, and they almost always say, but there's really no words to describe this. And the answer would not be on your list of a thousand things that you would have chosen if you were thinking for the perfect answer within the context of the illusion. Because it's literally out of time and space. But when you've had the reflection of that, you know inside, wow, something's just taken place here that wasn't there before. And it's such a beautiful experience. All right, you guys, we are going to say our prayer and then I will bid farewell to all until next week. So if everybody wants to just close their eyes and take a nice big deep breath. You got to mute us first. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. All right. So forgive us our illusions, Father, and help, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept with this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. All right, guys, have a super wonderful week and keep remembering, keep choosing when you remember and don't feel guilty if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. Goodbye. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, Marianne. You're so welcome. <laughs>